For many people, mountains are the love of their lives. Having climbed for the first time in their youth, people often become as if lovesick for the mountains, obsessing over their memories of the crisp mountain air, the adrenaline rushing through their veins, and the breathtaking views from the summit. From that moment on, everything changes. All one's dreams, longings, every idle thought becomes filled with them. The captivating stone giants gazing down on the world below. The 64-year-old Vladimir Ulyanov was one of those people for whom mountains had become a crucial part of their life. He constantly dreamed of new ascents, of conquering more and more peaks. Vladimir was an experienced mountaineer, so when he decided to take a trip through the mountains of Abkhazia, his family members let him go without a second thought. Despite his age, the man was in excellent physical shape. However, it is impossible to predict when and how the elements of nature might decide to take a person's life. Abkhazia is a partially recognized state in the Caucasus that used to be part of the Soviet Union. This small land is inhabited by Abkhazians, Georgians, Armenians, and Russians, and has two officially recognized languages, Abkhazian and Russian. Interestingly enough, in Soviet times, Abkhazia had a record number of centenarians per capita. Perhaps, this has something to do with the saying that Abkhazians have, bad people don't live long. Abkhazia is located in the northwestern part of the main Caucasus range and has access to the northeastern coast of the Black Sea. The coastal part of the region is quite popular with tourists, its mild and warm climate making it an attractive holiday destination all year round. The United Nations officially considers Abkhazia to be part of Georgia, but it is de facto governed by the authorities of the partially recognized Republic of Abkhazia. In the 1990s, disagreements between Georgia and Abkhazia led to an armed conflict, which eventually ended in a peace agreement signed in Moscow. In 2008, after another conflict, the so-called Five Day War, fought between Georgia on one side and the regions South Ossetia, Abkhazia, and Russia on the other. Russia recognized Abkhazia as an independent state. The conflict was once again resolved by a peace treaty, but tensions remained on both sides. Overall, we can confidently say that Abkhazia and its surrounding territories are a rather complicated region that is still permeated with geopolitical tensions. This, however, doesn't prevent Russian tourists from visiting it. About 75% of the region is covered by mountains, tall and splendid. They are the perfect destination for those who love to conquer peaks. In these mountains, however, you have to behave especially carefully. The roads leading through the mountain passes to Georgia are often mine-ridden and patrolled by armed squads. In the Abkhazian mountains, there are glaciers and crevasses of incredible beauty. They are also home to the two deepest caves in the world, Krubera Varonya Cave and Virovkina Cave, both located near the town of Gagara. But now, let's get back to today's climbing story. On May 3, 2021, a group of mountain climbers from the Russian cities of Yekaterinburg, St. Petersburg, and Chelyabinsk set out to conquer the peaks of Abkhazia. Their route went through Himza Pass, where they set up base camp, and then up to the highest point of the Bzib range, Mount Himsa. At 3,033 meters or 9,950 feet, Mount Himsa isn't particularly tall, and the route leading up to it is a Category 2 route out of six possible difficulty categories. It is famous, however, for its karst wells, caves, and mines, which can be dangerous for unprepared hikers. Participation was free of charge. The only criteria for hikers was a certificate that they had completed other routes and they had to be physically fit, 
which the organized characterized in a post in the Russian social network VK as follows. I would like to inform you of the general requirements you will need to complete the route. You should be able to run 40 to 45 minutes in training while covering 7 to 8 kilometers. If for some reason you cannot run, you should at least be able to walk 20 kilometers carrying a backpack weighing 18 kilograms for women and 22 kilograms for men without collapsing in exhaustion and be ready to go for a few more days. If you can do that, you can certainly complete this route. You'll be sleeping in a tent and technical and personal equipment can be rented. Vladimir Ulyanov, the namesake of the famous revolutionary Vladimir Ulyanov Lenin, was among the Russian climbers that had set out for him so that day. Vladimir was a well-prepared mountaineer who had conquered many peaks. A prolific hiker, he had visited the Altai Mountains as well as the Urals, and every weekend he would go trekking or cross-country skiing. Here's what he wrote on his page in the Russian social network VK on January 10th, just after his birthday, six months before the ascent. Celebrated yet another birthday today. Now I'm two to the power of six years old. I'm grateful to my body for giving me the opportunity to feel like I'm 40 to 45 years old, to walk easily, to participate in quite challenging climbs. Here's how Olga, an acquaintance of Ulyanov's from Yekaterinburg, described him. I've known Volodya since 2014. We met during a weekend hike. Since then, every weekend we go hiking or skiing. On average, route length is 18 to 30 kilometers, so Volodya is well trained physically. In 2019 we hiked around Lenin Peak at an average altitude of 3,500 to 4,100 meters. We didn't climb Lenin Peak itself, but we did conquer Yukin Peak at 5,150 meters. Volodya has been hiking since 1979. He's an experienced tracker. He has excellent navigational skills. We always relied on him when we weren't sure in which direction to go or how to get across a pass, for instance. He's a reliable person, not inclined to take unnecessary risks. As a hiking friend of mine says, if Volodya is on the team, the hike will go well. The group that Vladimir was in should have finished their track by the 10th of May, but unfortunately, they were running late. Their instructor was Anna Gilova, a rather experienced hiker from Nizhny Tagil who had previously taken other groups along this route. Because they were off schedule, Gilova and her group made their control call only on the 12th of May, and it was made directly to the emergency services. Because of the bad weather, the group couldn't return to just under Himsa Pass, where, as it turned out, they had left one of their teammates, Vladimir Ulyanov. According to Gilyova, the 64-year-old man wasn't easy to get along with, and she didn't particularly want to take him with her. But she told herself that the weather was supposed to be good during the hike, and she expected nothing bad to happen. She points out, however, that Vladimir wasn't a good team member. For example, he refused to participate in the on-site training with the others, believing that he was in good enough physical shape. But as it turned out, his physical condition wasn't that great. At some point during the climb, it became clear that the man was unable to go on. Since the others wanted to continue their journey, Gilova had no choice but to leave Ulyanov with a tent, a burner, and food supplies under the ridge, and return for Vladimir the next day. But when the group started to go back down, the weather changed, making it impossible to reach the base camp where Vladimir was staying. They had to go down another route, leaving him on top. Once the team got back to where there was cell phone coverage, they called the emergency services and told them what had happened. The search began. First, the rescuers decided to fly over the area to see if they could spot Vladimir, alive and unharmed, near the tent. Having reached the height of the base camp, however, they saw nothing. Just a huge white field without a trace of human presence. They couldn't even see the outlines of the camp or the tent, it had snowed during the night and the area was covered in snowdrifts. 
It was then decided to send a group of rescuers to the supposed place where Ulyanov had been left, a spot on the way to the base camp. All this time, Gilyova and the rest of the group were confident that Ilyanov was okay, even though he would have to wait on the slope for one more day. He had a stormproof tent, some food, and a gasoline burner. Basically, the minimum of everything you need to survive in the mountains for a short period of time. He would definitely be able to last one day. However, Anna later recalled that she had told Vladimir that if anything should happen, he would have to go down on his own. When the rescuers reached the camp, Ulyanov wasn't there. Could it be that the man had decided not to wait for the rescuers or his mates, and instead start the descent on his own? The rescuers were worried. Down by the river, on the outskirts of the forest, was a strip of land known as the Bermuda Triangle. Dubbed that because of how often hikers went missing there, one of the guides who took part in the search operation, Arthur Chalakan, describes this area as follows. This place is called the Bermuda Triangle. In Soviet days, many people went missing there. It seems easy, you reach the river, and along it, you eventually get to the sea, to civilization. But the further you go, the steeper the rapids get, and you might end up in a trap that is very difficult to get out of. This place is a proper vertical jungle. The hikers tried not to panic. Perhaps Vladimir had simply chosen a different route and would soon be found unharmed. However, the search went on. A new day dawned, yet no traces of Vladimir were found. After the first fruitless day of searching, the rescuers decided to split up to comb through a larger area. This is how Arthur Chalakan described the search. The next day, we divided up into two groups. One group explored the area from the river Himsa to the river Bzib. There is a good shack there, so there was a probability that he decided to go down there. But there were no fresh traces around, neither in the shack itself, nor along the path. The trail there is very bad, hardly discernible. We walked along both sides of the river, but found nothing. The second group climbed from the base camp almost to the Himsa Pass, up to the waterfall. They explored this area, especially where the first trees start, in case Vladimir started his descent here and tried to make a fire in the forest. We didn't go higher, because another group with Maxim and Slava was working up there, examining the spot where Ulyanov's group had initially left him. Our group was small. At first, there were five of us, but eventually only two of us were left. There were several reasons for that, the bad weather and the fact that some participants were not physically ready for a very difficult ascent at the intended pace. So three people went back down. We checked different theories. One of them was that Vladimir was in his tent and then decided to retrace the route taken by his group, as if to be saved. To do this, he had to climb the 2600 meter Paperechny Pass. We tried this out and realized that given the condition he was in, he would not have climbed it on his own. So we checked this theory and dismissed it as unpromising. The second idea was that we reinvestigate the place where the first rescue group comprised of emergency services and Anna Gilova had found a fire pit in mid-May. We went down along the Likim River to the confluence with the East Gumista River and headed upstream. The goal was to find a trail and check its passability. The coordinates told us we had reached the fireside, but since the grass had grown over, we couldn't find it. We surveyed the trail and made a conclusion. Unless you have a navigator and a detailed map of the area, it will be impossible to find the trail on your own. Someone had chopped their way through in the 1980s, but now it is completely overgrown. So we dismissed this direction of the missing hiker's possible movement as unpromising as well. The search was undertaken both by well-trained rescuers and by volunteers, gathered together by Vladimir's friends, who at one point even had to be evacuated from the mountain by helicopter. The hikers were exhausted, 
they were combing through all the possible routes, wrecking their brains as to which way Vladimir might have gone and spending all their energy on the search. Some bit off more than they could chew and put themselves in danger. The next day, a VK group was created to help in the search. Volunteers wrote about their progress, about the rescuers, and about the places they explored. Everyone was worried about Vladimir and rallied to find him. Unfortunately, Vladimir's teammates didn't leave him a map or any means of communication. As for food, they left him with some soup cans, candy, and cookies. And he had no wood to make a fire. With so few supplies and one tent, it's hardly surprising that Vladimir left the camp after his teammates didn't pick him up in the agreed upon time frame. However, it was strange that Vladimir hadn't left a note. Usually, hikers make a mound of stones in which they put a note containing information about where they are going. Since Vladimir had no map or navigation device, perhaps he simply didn't know precisely where to go and remembered only that the instructor told him in case of emergency to go down to the forest. So perhaps his descent was just guesswork. Svetlana, a friend of Vladimir's who often joined him on climbs, didn't understand how such an incident could have happened at all. We've known each other for over 20 years. We used to go on hikes together. He had never been in a situation like this. Never before had he met people who would leave their mates in need. And he himself wouldn't do that either. He's a wonderful man, kind and sympathetic, always ready to help. He hiked a lot and often. During the search operation, rescuers inspected every crevasse, every cave, looking for any traces of a fire or abandoned clothing. Since there were many wild animals in the forest, one theory was that he was attacked by a bear. However, all the theories turned out to be dead ends. Olyanov seemed to have vanished into thin air in this mountainous Bermuda Triangle. Local hunters were warned about the search, and a helicopter of the Apazian Emergency Service regularly flew over the area in good weather. On June 9th, the search team and the emergency service decided to end the search. No traces of Vladimir were found. So what could have happened to him? In May 2021, the weather in the mountains was terrible. Almost every day there was rain, which sometimes turned into snow. The temperature was about 7 to 10 degrees Celsius during the day and 3 to 5 degrees Celsius at night. Vladimir, left alone in a tent with little food, no map or navigation aids, apparently decided to descend on his own, relying on his experience. How did his disappearance come about then? It seems most likely that Vladimir slipped and fell into one of the area's many crevasses, drowned in a river, or was carried away by one of the waterfalls in the Bermuda Triangle. These versions make sense because neither his equipment nor his tent has been found. Or perhaps he was dragged away by a wild animal, of which there are many in the region. During their search, for instance, the rescuers saw three bears on the ridge. Olyanov's teammates concluded that he was betrayed by his own experience. Relying on his extensive training, he decided to go down even though the right thing would have been to stay in the mountain and wait for help. Is the group's instructor, Anna Gilyova, to blame? Did she have the right to leave the hiker alone on the mountain? Usually, a climber is left behind only if the rest of the group is in mortal danger. And this wasn't the case here. The other hikers simply wanted to move on. According to several members of the group, at some point, the climb turned into a race in which Vladimir apparently could not participate, so he was left alone. Due to the high-profile nature of the case, Gilova, the organizer, described the events of that day in a post. She said that her first meeting with Vladimir went well. He told her about his experience in hiking, explained how he was preparing for his trip to the mountains, and he signed a release that he was familiar with the safety precautions. All the same, he was given less weight to carry than the rest of the participants due to his age, only 6.9 kilograms. On May 4th, as they were still ascending, Olyanov's backpack fell into the river from a height of 70 meters. 
He had put it on the rocks in the wrong place. His fellow tourists went to great lengths to retrieve it, but all the contents were wet. They had to redistribute his stuff among other backpacks and quickly make up for the time that was lost. Kiryova also noted that Vladimir walked more slowly than the others, often lagging behind by 10 to 15 minutes, arriving last at the camps and once the guide had to carry his backpack. According to her, he admitted that he hadn't taken the reparation seriously enough, which was making it hard for him. He was already tired by the middle of the journey, he refused to go any further. At every stop he would ask if he could stay put and wait for the group to return after reaching the peak. They finally arrived at a good place for a break and that's where he would wait. Yelyova told Vladimir where he should go to in case of emergency and strictly forbade him from entering the forest so he wouldn't miss the group when it returned. The weather was still good. We left him enough food for seven meals. Soup, crackers, dried apricots, nuts, sweets, tea and sugar. He had a metal bowl and camping supplies, paper and a pen, 10 meters of bright ribbon, a red two-person storm tent with a snow skirt, a backpack, personal items, an ice axe, a helmet and crampons. His phone and camera worked. I'm not sure about the battery levels. We decided not to leave a map, we had several copies, because we didn't want him to get any ideas about going anywhere alone. Before they left, the tourists repeatedly told Vladimir not to go anywhere. The Russian Ministry of Internal Affairs launched an investigation into the disappearance of Vladimir Ulyanov. A year later, in April 2022, the experts determined that the instructor was indeed to blame. She was wrong to leave Ulyanov, who was not feeling well, alone. They also found that it was a violation of safety rules that Vladimir wasn't present at the training sessions for the route. Perhaps, during them, it would have become clear that his physique was not at the proper level for this climb. Nevertheless, no criminal charges were filed against Anna Gilyova. The search for Vladimir's body has been discontinued. Now, we can only hope the mountain will give him back at some point, as it sometimes happens. Many people on mountaineering forums blamed the instructor, but a fairly large number agreed with her. It's not unusual for someone to be left in a safe place to wait for the rest of the hikers when they can't go on, and the group is about to reach the top. This time, however, it ended tragically. One person called out Gilova's decision as reckless and dangerous, writing, they just left the man. Vladimir's age was also hotly debated online some believing that it had nothing to do with anything, while others said it could have strongly affected his strength and endurance. However, after having hiked the mountains for more than a decade, shouldn't he have known what awaited him? As it were not for the irresponsible attitude of the instructor and other members of the group, Vladimir might have survived. Had they gone down together all at once, maybe nothing bad would have happened. However, the group wanted to conquer the summit at any cost, and that cost turned out to be their oldest teammate. Of course, Vladimir also made a mistake. Had he waited for two days, rescuers definitely would have found him. However, he was probably worried that something horrible had happened to his group and decided that he was to rely on himself only. Yulova and the rescue team believed that his descent was successful the fireside found at the foot of Mount Himsa was most likely Vladimir's work. Where he set off to afterwards, however, remains a mystery. What happened to Vladimir Ulyanov? That is a question for the elements, the silent mountains, the mysterious Bermuda Triangle, where many brave hikers meet their end. Vladimir himself said of his beloved mountains, It's not me who conquers mountains. It's the mountains that conquer me. And that's our story for today. I once read in a book about an ascent to Mont Blanc that many climbers don't mind dying in the mountains. Of course, they would like to live longer, but it is an honor for them to die doing what they loved most. Perhaps this thought will alleviate at least a modicum of the pain that Vladimir Ulyanov's family feels. 
Share your thoughts in the comments and if you like the way I make these videos, subscribe to my channel. Stay safe.